Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our uh, third webinar series that we have with the Strategic Farming webinar series. And I'm Liz Stahl, I'm Extension Educator in Crops out of the Worthington Regional Office today, and I'll be moderating our session today. And just a reminder, if you were not able to join in our previous webinars, we had one on December 19th, uh, focused on a back to basics approach to nutrient management. And then we had one on January 16th, that was soybean management for 2020 and beyond. Uh, all those, well, all our webinars are being recorded and those are available online right now uh, for viewing. So on this one will be recorded as well. Uh, and just to know, it does take a little bit of time to do the closed captioning, but once that's done, you should find, again, all these webinars in the series online. Uh, we do have some webinars coming up in the future as well on February 13th, over the noon hour again from 12 to one. We'll have on new pests and pathogens complicate Minnesota soybean and, and corn production. And then on Thursday, February 27th, over the noon hour again, still going from 12 to one. We'll have hot topics and weed management, putting the pieces together. So before we uh, get started today, just a few housekeeping things. Uh, we do have two speakers today. We have Drs. Axel Garcia y Garcia and Paulo Pagularly, uh, both from the Southwest Research and Outreach Center in Lamberton. They're going to discuss their research on uh, cover crops today. But if you do have any questions during their presentations, uh, you can just use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. So if you're not familiar with where that is, just kind of hover around the bottom of your screen and that icon should pop up. Uh, so again, you can just type in your question at any time, but we'll plan to address those questions at the end once they both have spoken. Uh, there's also a chat icon. So if you're having some technical difficulties or sound issues, you know, please let us know through that and we'll see if we, what we can do to address any of those. We do have Phyllis Bongard. She's our extension communications and content specialist. She's helping us in the background uh, here to address any issues that might pop up. Now, one thing we do have, uh, all of us are at different locations today. So if we do experience any freezing up on the internet, hopefully we don't have that happen, uh, but we'll do what we can to address those issues as quickly as possible. Um, and last thing too, there is going to be an evaluation link. I just wanna remind you of that, that will pop up in the chat box at the end. We'll also have that on the screen. Uh, we really do encourage you to fill that out. This is kind of a newer venture for us. So we really do appreciate your uh, comments and suggestions again as we try out this kind of new method of getting information out to everybody. So with that, uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Axel Garcia Garcia. Uh, he's an assistant professor in sustainable cropping systems, again at the Southwest Research and Outreach Center in Lamberton, and he's going to discuss matching cover crops to your goals. So Axel, I'll uh, switch it over to you. Okay, thank you very much to everybody um, joining this uh, webinar. I should say that this is my first one of a kind, so hopefully everything is going to be okay. Uh, I will uh, like to thank uh, Phyllis and Liz for putting this uh, webinar together uh, with me and Paolo, who actually is just uh, across my office, but uh, we don't we don't get to get together too 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 often to do this kind of thing. So anyway, so. Uh, to start with, uh, I was asked if I could talk a little bit about cover crops and how this uh, technology could uh, match uh, our farm goals. So this is going to be my, my talk for this webinar. So uh, quickly, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, what I can show you right now. Um, why cover crops? I've been talking about that for, you know, since I came to the University of Minnesota, actually. Uh, how cover crops interact with uh, soil health, uh, limitations of cover crops uh, using Minnesota. I mean, the reasons why sometimes we think that cover crops is really uh, a very difficult uh, practice for our conditions here. Um, and then again, uh, why cover crops, uh, how weather uh, interacts with cover crops and how our uh, you know, day-to-day uh, -day weather conditions and our interannual variation in weather conditions might affect that practice as well. Uh, and then I would jump into uh, the type of research we have been doing, and uh, I would finish my talk with some uh, final uh, remarks. Uh, that being said, uh, so why cover crops? Well, cover crops actually, you know, 
has have been used for several years. And in fact, uh, we know very well that they work. Now the question is whether or not they will work everywhere. So, but the main reason why cover crops, you know, is uh, the reasons why cover crops are because one, they will considerably reduce uh, erosion and, and improve infiltration. And the, 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 and the reason for that is because basically they will cover the ground and they will improve the, the structure of the soil. So as you can see here in these two graphs, I have these are results from some of our our research, uh, you can see that with uh, the use uh, of, of cover crops, uh, different types of cover crops, you will have, you know, a different uh, cover percentage. So the better you cover your, your soil, obviously, uh, the better it's going to be in terms of reducing erosion. Uh, and eventually, because you have more cover, more cover, you are going to have more growth or more biomass. So you will eventually also increase uh, a, enhance your, the infiltration of your soil. So all these things uh, are well known and we've been looking at these things specifically for conditions here in, in, in Minnesota. Then also uh, cover crops uh, will recycle nutrients. Uh, and how does it work? Basically, we are going to be seeding cover crops. Uh, uh, hopefully after we harvest our main crops and then those cover crops to grow obviously are going to be using uh, uh, inputs such as nutrients, water, and that eventually will, it, it will go back into the system when we terminate those cover crops that is going to decompose and that organic matter eventually is going to release nitrogen and other nutrients into the soil. And hopefully in time enough for the next cash crop to use it. Uh, that obviously is not very evident uh, in Minnesota because again, uh, we have something that is called weather or our climate in general that uh, it makes things a little bit difficult. And as I said previously, uh, cover crops will improve organic matter. This is obviously, obviously much more evident in situations where organic matter is naturally low. So you will see improvements in the, in the uh, in, in organic matter in your soil if you are in a location where uh, there is not much. But in the Southwest, in Southwest Minnesota, for example, where, where it's very common to have uh, four or even 5% organic matter, uh, you will also in, improve it, but that's going to come over time. It's gonna take a little bit longer. Okay, so uh, as I was saying at the beginning, uh, we have our major, probably major from my perspective, our major factor to limit our ability to grow cover crops in Minnesota is our climate and our daily weather. So that's why I said that the integration of cover crops in the corn soybean rotation is challenging. So what happens with our weather conditions? Well, we have a very narrow window of opportunity either before planting or after harvest. So uh, because of this, you have very little heat units uh, for cover crops to grow. Uh, in other words, uh, if we plant cover crops at the end of the season, it will take 30 to 45 days with cooling temperatures uh, before it gets into really very cold to grow those cover crops. So it's basically very, very, very narrow window. And then if we try to see those cover crops at the beginning of the season in the spring, uh, the situation is a little bit inverse. We are improving the, 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 temperature, the air temperature and the soil temperature, but it's pretty wet because it rains a lot, so it becomes very difficult. Uh, uh, and also in the spring, we will soon be planting our uh, cash crops. So it becomes really a matter of uh, whether or not uh, our weather is going to allow us to do that. Uh, in that context, uh, you can see here, and I am going to click uh, a couple of more times here. You can see here uh, regular growing seasons for con season for conditions here in Lamberton. So basically, this green growing season I have here, uh, we can say that uh, is for corn and soybeans, either one. Uh, and we are trying to grow cover crops uh, when we don't have corn and soybeans at field. So. The options we have at this point is either to plant at the end, which is impossible basically, or at the beginning. So if we plant at the end, probably the, our, our 
safer approach, let's say, is to intercede those cover crops when corn and soybean are still at the field. So there are different ways we can intercede those cover crops. So one obviously is using a high clearance vehicle and the other one, or a high bore, the other one would be just air seeding. Uh, and at the beginning of the season, if we were to do that, if weather conditions will allow us to do that, it would be much easier because we can just go ahead and drill the cover crops. But as I said at the beginning, uh, this is not really very evident. Well, that said, then let's imagine that we are interceding cover crops at the end of the season here. For corn, we intercede cover crops when corn is about to get mature at R5 uh, and uh, R6 uh, stages of uh, development. So we intercede cover crops when corn is still at field and then we harvest the corn and then the cover crops take over and grow a little bit. But you can see that uh, when cover crops start to grow, uh, basically the temperature has already dropped. And along with the temperature, we are, we are start, starting to have shorter days. So that means less light. Light is for growth, temperature is for development. So uh, we cannot play gods here. So basically it's so little time we have and the crop can, will not make too much biomass. Still, our research has shown us that interseeding uh, will allow for the cover crop to get well established, okay? And at least if we talk on a cover crop that is going to overwinter like uh, cereal rye, uh, then the next season will come out uh, pretty quickly as soon as uh, temperature allows uh, and it will take over again. So, but in the next season, just when the cover crops starting to grow, you know, aggressively, we have to terminate it. So we have to kill it yeah, using a herbicide or any other mean, and then we plant our next uh, cash crop again. So you can see at the end of the season, we have more or less 45 days. We, could, we can go even to a little bit more, but I mean safely probably 45 days. And at the beginning of the season in the spring, we have more or less uh, between 50 to 55 days as well, assuming that it's going to uh, start to warm up pretty early uh, in the spring, which is not always like that. Okay, let's see how it looks like uh, for our conditions here in terms of uh, heat units. You know, heat units, or we also call them growing degree days. What we did here was we calculate the growing degree days for 30 years. So the black line you see here are, is the average of 30 days 30 days of growing degree days. And the bars you see here is the variation that exists at every single day from August the 1st uh, through the end of October and then from 1st of March to the end of July. So why we did that from August the 1st to October the 28th? Well, we did it because we wanted to see how early uh, we have to plant a cover crop like cereal rye, this is for cereal rye actually, in order to get a good biomass before the first frost. And then also in the spring all the way to the end of July, we imagine that we could have the cereal rye not only as cover crop but also to produce uh, grain. So interestingly, you can see that obviously as we advance in the season in the fall, you know, the growing degree days, uh, you know, absolute values uh, drop decrease to a point where if you were to plant cover crop by the end of October, basically it's not going to grow anything because it's already too cold. And then in March again, if you have cover crop coming up in March, it's going to grow very slowly because there is not much heat, but as time passes, it will grow more. But let's see what happened if we imagine that uh, we plant a cover crop in August the 1st. So by the time we terminate that cover crop, which is the green uh, uh, curve here, uh, we, have, we had already accumulated more or less 2,400 uh, growing degree days, okay? But if we plant the same cover crop, which is winter rye, later in the season, more or less uh, the 26th of September, which is actually when we do it here in, in, in our experiments, we only, uh, accumulated less than 800 growing degree days. So you see the big difference that exists. 
whenever, whenever we, we see that cover crop in default, uh, then assuming that it's going to be good and start to warm up early in this season, the next season, uh, the next spring, uh, you can see that it start accumulating going, uh, going degree days to more or less around 800 as well, which is similar to when the first, uh, first, first uh, frost comes. But when that happens, you can see here is end of April. We had to terminate it because we had to plant corn or soybeans here. So again, you see that our window or the window we have for those cover crops to grow is very narrow. Now, if we were to leave this, this cereal right to grow all the way to produce uh, grain, this is the number of growing degree days that is going to accumulate, more than 3,000 growing degree days, assuming that we start early in, this, in, in the spring. So that's a huge difference. So what happens in terms of uh, biomass, if we see winter rye in August the 1st, by the time the, the, the first frost comes, the biomass, if we plant it in August the 1st, assuming that conditions are good, the only condition that change here is, is weather, uh, we could get uh, biomass as much as more than 3,500 uh, pounds per acre and as little as 1,000, okay? On average, we will get some 25, 2,800 pounds. Uh, 20, 2,800 pounds of uh, bio, uh, dry biomass per acre. Okay, that's if we plant in August the 1st, and then so on. But usually, as I said previously, we plant around here for our experiments, and this is what we can do at field as well. So if, when we do it the way we are doing it, we should expect no more than 800, 1,000 uh, pounds per acre of biomass in the fall. So it's very little. I would say that eventually it's really marginal, okay? The advantage of this, of seeding late is that, or, or seeding in the fall is that your crop is already established and it will take full advantage of whatever is gonna happen next year in the spring. Okay, again, this experiment uh, uh, was a modeling uh, practice and we use winter rye with observed data. So basically the information our models gave us here, it matches what we have found at field. So it's good and it tells us that we shouldn't expect too much biomass in the fall, but we should try to see our cover crops in the fall so they will take full advantage of the spring in the next season. Okay. Uh, so we've been doing research on uh, in cover crops into the corn and soybean rotation uh, since uh, 2015, basically. Uh, and we have several experiments here. We have experiments that are conducted only in Lumberton, others in Grand Rapids, Lumberton and Wasika, and others only in Lumberton and Wasika, and finally here in Lumberton and in Morris as well. So we are testing uh, different uh, sorts of uh, cover crops and uh, also cover crop uh, mixes. Uh, we are doing all the way things from, uh, you know, early seeded cover crops, that means in the spring, to late seeded cover crops, that means at the end of the season. And we also tried last year some summer uh, crops as well. So today uh, in this webinar, I will talk a little bit about early seeding, late seeding, and uh, summer seeding cover crops and how that looks like for us. Okay, some of the options we have for early seeded cover crops uh, are the following. The first one is annual rye. And when I say early seeded means we are gonna be interseeding this cover crop into standing corn only. We do not uh, interseed uh, cover crops into standing uh, soybean at the beginning of the season because soybeans basically cover the ground very quickly and then it's basically it's dark under the soybean, uh, under a soybean crop and nothing is going to grow. You, you will be just uh, throwing away your money and you know wasting your time. If you have a situation where you have, uh, let's say a soybean that grows uh, much more uh, vertical and you have larger uh, 
distance between rows, it might grow. I, I've seen uh, some people talking on interceding cover crops into standing soybeans at the beginning of the season with a relative success. But for us here, I can tell you it has not worked yet. So annual rye is a cool season uh, grass, but it does pretty well if you seed it early in the season uh, during the during the spring, uh, it grows more or less to up to four uh, inches. Uh, inches uh, has an extensive root system. Um, for temperature, uh, if it's too dry and you have a drought, it's going to have a, a poor growth. Uh, it likes uh, well-drained uh, soils, uh, and it also likes if you have a, a very firm, a nice seed bed. Uh, and it will emerge with soils, uh, soil temperature at 55 uh, degrees. So it's original from, originally from Europe. So it makes sense that uh, it, it likes our conditions here. And you might expect for us in Minnesota, uh, biomass uh, varying from two to four tons per acre, uh, which means that the, potentially you might have some between 40 to 80 pounds of nitrogen in one acre uh, at termination time in the tissue of that uh, crop. So another one uh, is crimson clover. We've been using crimson clover and it does pretty well. Uh, one of the uh, nice things of crimson clover is that it looks like it, it does pretty well under shaded conditions, better than annual rye actually. And even uh, you can see this picture here, this is one of our trials here at, at the, at the Southwest Rock in, in Lumberton is flowering. It, this is under corn, uh, grows to up to three uh, uh, feet. Uh, has a very good tap root, uh, and uh, also doesn't like too much drought. Uh, it likes uh, well-drained soils uh, and uh, also a good seed bed. Uh, and can germinate with uh, soil temperature as low as 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Also originally from Europe, and can produce up to 2.5 uh, tons per acre of dry mass for conditions here in, in, in the southwest of Minnesota. And the potential for nitrogen in, uh, uptake from this crop is, goes up to 150. That depends on the conditions, obviously. And obviously, the, the nice thing of uh, crimson clover is that it's a legume crop, which means uh, it fixes nitrogen. So it's, it's bringing nitrogen into the system. So the question you might have is, OK, but when that nitrogen is going to be available for the next crop? And this is something that uh, Paolo will be talking about in the next, uh, in the next talk. So we also have late seeded cover crops, uh, the, the most, uh, most common one, and, most known one here in our region is cereal rye or winter rye, okay? It's from uh, Southwest Asia. Uh, it's a cool season, cereal rye grain. Uh, can grow as much as, uh, as seven feet tall, but I, I, I have never uh, seen such a uh, tall uh, cereal rye. Has an extensive root system uh, over winters, which is great for us. Uh, is relatively drought tolerant. It likes well-drained soils. Uh, it tolerates a little bit of, uh, you know, rain water, uh, but also likes uh, firm seed bed. And one important thing for cereal rye is that uh, it can germinate with very low temperatures, as low as 34, uh, 34 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, biomass, it can produce up to two, two and a half tons per acre. Uh, it can be used for grain, bread, even whiskey, vodka, uh, for animals as well. Um, and uh, we can expect to have between 30 to 70 pounds of nitrogen um, if when terminated in the spring in, a, in one acre. Uh, from our research, we have, we have found up to close to 60 pounds per acre here. Uh, Paolo as well will be looking about that. So another late seeded cover crop, uh, another option is our camelina and pennycress. I know that uh, for some of us, the second one, pennycress is mostly a weed, but it turns out uh, pennycress, it has a very high oil content in, and uh, is one of the, let's say, uh, most important new crops 
that is being researched, researched nowadays uh, because uh, industry like the aviation industry would like to have, you know, uh, bio diesel or whatever from this type of crops. So uh, Camelina is uh, from uh, the Mediterranean Europe and uh, Penicres is from Eurasia. So both survive our winners. Uh, I have been working with both of them, and, but I've been doing more work with Camelina. So some of the things is that both crops are so far, it looks like they are low input demanding crops, but I can tell you that uh, at least for Camerina, which, which is the one I've been working more with, has responded very well to nitrogen. It looks like if you apply some 60 to 80 pounds of nitrogen per hectare, it will produce lots of seeds, uh, much more seeds. But still, uh, the important thing for in this case, for this talk, is that we are suggesting that these two uh, winter oil seed crops could be used specifically for as cover crop. So which, which means that we can plant them and then terminate them, not let them go in, into seed production. If you plant these crops without uh, fertilization, basically you, the seed yield is gonna be very low and it's gonna be seeding, uh, you will have to harvest them around 20th of June or a bit late, which means you are going to be late uh, for planting your next uh, cash crop. So then last year with uh, Liz Stahl, uh, we decided to try some summer uh, cover crops here in the station. Uh, and the reason why we did that was first uh, because of this problem we had with, uh, you know, prevent planting. So we were trying to find, uh, you know, some options for our farmers, uh, even though we did it the year that we had that prevent planting. And hopefully it won't happen again, but we are dealing with the weather conditions, so we never know. And we try some of them. Some of the, the ones we try are TEF. TEF is uh, from Ethiopia. It produces lots of biomass. Uh, it can provide us to up to 100 pounds per acre of nitrogen. Uh, and uh, you can harvest it for human consumptions as well. I mean, the grain of TEF is used in Ethiopian cuisine to produce this uh, pancake-like tortilla-like food they, they, they serve at their restaurants. It's really very good. But anyway, it, it grows very well, as you will see soon. Another one we tried was permulet, uh, which is from Central Africa. Uh, it produces lots of biomass, you will see soon. Uh, and also because of the large amount of biomass that it produced, uh, you might get up to 150 pounds of nitrogen per hectare in this case. Uh, then we also try sorghum sudan grass, another very, very good option for the summertime here produces lots of biomass, as you can see, and related to the biomass is the amount of nitrogen that you could eventually have from this, this cover crop that is going to be recycling it in this system. Uh, I will show you here uh, a couple of videos. This is, uh, this is the trial uh, Liz and I put together to, to try to see which summer cover crop will do better. So we planted on July the 12th, and a little bit more uh, uh, after one month after planting, we recorded this and you will see what, what, uh, how it looks like. The first one you will see is a cereal rye, then you will have uh, crimson clover, then uh, you will have forage radish, the combination of those three, and then at the end they come the, the summer ones. You can see that cereal rye, crimson clover, and forage radish didn't do very well. There were several issues with basically too much rainfall eventually, and then we have dry conditions. But then you will see what happens with uh, the next one. As you can see, you see the huge difference. This is per millet. It produced a lot of biomass, and this is just a little bit over a month after seeding it. This is Sudan grass grows very aggressively. And then we have oats. And finally, uh, teff, which also has some issues here because the seeds washed out. We have a couple of very heavy rainfall events. That was 34 days after planting. 
it, we did the same thing uh, 40 days after planting. That means six days later uh, of the previous uh, uh, of the previous uh, video. And you will see here, now we are gonna go back. The first one you are gonna see is Steph, then Oates. Uh, so let me see here. This is Steph, reduce the noise here. This is Oats. Then you have uh, Sudan grass. Then you will have permillet. It's really amazing in 40 days how much biomass those uh, summer crops can do. This is permillet. And then we have the combination of cereal rye, crimson clover, and forage here. This is uh, the porridge radish here. Crimson clover was really bad. And finally, we have here the cereal rye. So the reason why cereal rye basically didn't do very well is because it's a cool season crop. And we were planting cereal rye in July. It really suffered. So, you know, message here is don't try to use cereal rye for, uh, as, a cereal, uh, as a summer crop, a cover crop, because basically it's not going to do very well but you have several other options as you saw that there. So let me tell you quickly here with these cover crops we were using in the summer. Uh, this is the yield in, uh, in, of dry matter per acre that we produce with each one of these cover crops. You can see uh, how much yield we produce and this is the estimated nitrogen that was extracted from the soil from each one of these, uh, these cover crops is really a lot of, of biomass, you know? And uh, obviously because you have a lot of biomass, you will potentially have lots of nitrogen as well in that tissue. But more, more striking is these numbers here. This is the growth rate. In other words, it's telling us how many pounds of dry matter per day we are putting in an acre which, with each one of these uh, cover crops. For example, this one, the Sudan grass, each day in an acre, Sudan grass was giving us 123 pounds of biomass uh, here in Lumberton. So you can see that it's really lots of biomass. Anyways, so finally, um, do cover crops affect the yield of corn and soybeans? Well, the way we have done our experiments, which means interceding late in the season and then terminating it more or less seven to 10 days before we plant corn and soybeans, the, the, uh, the, the, the response is no, they do not affect the yield of corn uh, and soybeans. Uh, I just put here for the sake of time, uh, the yield of corn at different locations. This is one of my grad students who just uh, defended uh, two, three months ago. Uh, but basically what we are showing here is what no matter what type of cover crop you use, this is annual rye and this is cereal rye. And then each one of the rice are combined with crimson clover or forage radish and crimson clover. And we did that at different locations. And for three years, this is only for Lumberton in 17 and 18. But in all cases, we had no difference on yield of Corn. That means corn yield was not affected. Similarly, uh, we also tried to do that. The previous one was a, an early seeding. This is a late seeding. Uh, you can see that for at different locations. This is, uh, this is in Grand Rapids. This is in Lumberton. And this is in Wasika. Uh, 17 and 18, no uh, difference in yield of corn regardless of what type of cover crop treatment we had. So we are, let's say, basically our research is telling us that, yes, we can put cover crops in the field the way we did it, we, term we terminated it early, uh, and uh, that is not going to affect the yield of our, our corn and soybeans. Of course, if we change the, that situation, things might be uh, a little bit different. And then also we have cover crops with different uh, tillage practices at different years uh, here in Lumberton. You can see that again, yield of corn was not affected. The differences you see uh, within a year, 
are basically because of the different uh, tillage practices and between years was not compared yet, but you can see basically that, you know, what happens here is the differences are because of uh, weather conditions, basically. So this is uh, in Lamberton and this is in Wasika, no difference or whatsoever. So my final remarks are that, uh, yes, uh, our weather conditions uh, are the most important factors that affect the establishment of cover crops in Minnesota. And basically location matters. Uh, so we should consider weather conditions to optimize growth of cover crops and uh, in our specific location. And also, uh, we know that uh, summer cover crops grow very fast, which means that we have to be very careful uh, uh, for a, when we go to terminate those cover crops. Otherwise, it's going to, we are going to be in a situation that is going to be you know, out of our hands. So, and finally, nitrogen used by cover crops uh, seeded in spring or fall do not affect the yield of corn and soybeans, even though I did I didn't show here the soybeans data, you know, uh, we have already well-documented information that uh, its yield is not affected. So with that, that's what I had for you. So my research has been supported by different instances, such as the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, the soybean growers, corn growers, and uh, funds from the National Science Foundation, uh, which is a federal institution. So I, I appreciate your time. And uh, if you have any questions, just uh, let us know. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, Axel. Um, while you're switching over screens, I will introduce Paulo. Uh, again, our next speaker is Dr. Paulo Pagularly. He's a nutrient management specialist here at the Southwest Research and Outreach Center in Lamberton. And he's going to talk about, can my cover crops supply my fertilizer needs? So thank you everybody for attending this session and listening in or for those that are calling in. Thanks so much for taking the time to see what we have to share with you. And thank you, Axel, for the very thorough um, overview of cover crop work that has been done uh, in Minnesota. So yeah, I will continue talking a little bit more about uh, what do we know about uh, the fertilizer needs for the crop uh, and what the cover crop is actually doing in terms of nutrient removal. Um, I think Axel showed pretty good that um, the results that we have seen here in Lamberton are showing that cover crop doesn't seem to affect uh, nutrient needs, but let's take a deeper look and see what we are seeing based on other varieties and neighboring states and, and whatnot. Just to go back a little bit and, and why to plant cover crop, I actually gave a pretty good reasoning, but just to emphasize a couple uh, things that Axel talked about. One of the main areas is to cover bare soil, which prevents soil erosion. Uh, and this is a very critical uh, aspect of why we wanna start keeping our soil covered. Uh, for those of you driving on the roads now, you can see that there's a lot of brown snow on the ditches, especially with all the wind we've been getting this year. A lot of the soil that is bare is, we can really see that it's moving around with the wind and the snow, and we can see a lot of soil being lost. Improved soil quality. Um, for example, like Axel said, those very uh, good growth, the, the Crover crops that have a very strong root system, they can really go down uh, and start some nice deep channels that the water can go through quickly, which would help with soil drainage. Uh, they also produce a lot of root exudates that are good for uh, producing strong soil aggregates that also helps with water infiltration. Um, makes the soil more mellow, makes it easier for roots to growth. And most importantly, it produces shelter for microbes and other small microorganisms, which do all the uh, biomass mineralization. And with that, all the nutrient cycling in the soil. So having uh, uh, a good habitat for the microbes in the soil, it's very important. And we are very aware now that having all of the monocropping that we've been doing, corn on corn or corn and soybean, 
is very restrictive in terms of root exudate. There's only two types of plants being grown in these rotation systems, and that really limits what the microbes have to eat in the soil. Um, so having a cover crop in there provides extra food for the microbial community. And depending on the strategy you're using with your cover crop, there is also a lot of weed suppression that we, we can see happen. Uh, Axel showed you some of the data that he has collected, but the literature shows a little wider amount of nitrogen that can be removed with a cover crop. For example, we can go from 10 pounds to 200 pounds per acre, the amount of nitrogen that cover crop uh, are removing from the soil and putting them into biomass. <clears throat> and usually <clears throat> the grass cover crops like the rice and the oats, um, those uh, or the sun and grass or whatever that Axel was showing you, majority were grass cover crops. And those are the ones that are best for removing nitrogen because they grow a lot quicker and they have a very high potential to remove nitrogen. Whereas if we're talking about a legume, then that's not really going to remove much nitrogen from the system because it's in most cases, it's going to be um, fixing the nitrogen that they use. So it's not really gonna count towards uh, removing nitrogen from the system. Although <clears throat> we do have data showing that improves nutrient dynamics, uh, we are not entirely sure that improves nutrient availability. And that's where some of the contradiction comes in, especially when you're starting to have a wide range of cover crops in the system. So just to highlight a couple things of research has shown, as I was saying, there is increased aggregate stability, increased soil organic matter, uh, reduced penetration resistance, uh, increased total porosity, available water, and we also see reduced uh, soil nitrate, because as the biomass is growing, is removing a lot of the nitrogen from the soil. And when we test for nitrate, we see a reduction, which is good because that means that the nitrate is not going to be moving with the water. And if there is excessive rainfall coming through and that biomass is growing and removing the nitrate, you're not going to see nitrate moving with that water. It's not going to go into the groundwater or it's going to not going to go out to the tile. So it's keeping that nitrogen uh, within that system. So when everything goes well, uh, we did a meta-analysis uh, and we looked up some of the meta-analysis that had been done. Um, having uh, a crop rotation, for example, corn and a soybean, uh, we found that using cover crop would increase corn yield by as much as 21% compared to where there was no cover crop. Again, the, the grass, uh, when you look at the species, the grass cover crop, like the rye or the treat kale or the southern grass, those things didn't really help uh, with the grain yield. Um, they had no effect, so they did not drag the yield and they did not improve the yield. But when we look at adding legume cover crops, that's where we saw a very significant uh, improving yield, especially when we looked in the control plots, we see that where fertilizer is not added, then the cover crop really helps uh, provide nutrients to that crop that is growing. But again, as I've been saying, that's going to depend on the cover crop species that we are using. When we look particularly with the radish family and the brassicaceae, uh, we are seeing some very contrasting results where sometimes um, there is no effect in yield. Sometimes there seems to be a little bit of a yield increase but a lot of cases we're seeing yield decrease when you have a radish in that cover crop mix. And I'm gonna go through some of the studies now here. For example, <clears throat> this was a study that's being done in North Dakota uh, and they looked at corn grain yield as a function of uh, nitrogen application rates in pounds per acre. Uh, and for those on the phone that can't see the figures being presented, uh, they applied the 0, 40, 80, 120, 160, and 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre with cover crop and without cover crop. And some of the things that they saw is that wherever there was no cover crop planted, 
the yields tend to be a bit higher as much as um, about 30, 30 bushels per acre or so um, when there was no fertilizer applied. And some other things that they found is that the maximum um, yield for when you had no cover crop, you needed about 140 pounds of nitrogen to get as much as 240 bushels an acre. Whereas to get that same yield where you have a cover crop planted, you needed to apply 171 pounds of N. So there was about a 30 pounds of N per acre drag uh, or deficit where you had a cover crop compared to where no cover crop was planted. Um, <clears throat> so when they looked at the, the nitrogen, uh, the carbon to nitrogen ratio, uh, they found that the ratio in there was 20 to one. And some studies have shown now that whenever the cover crop carbon to nitrogen ratio is below 30 to one, the cover crop biomass should mineralize quickly and the nitrogen should be available but in this case, it wasn't. Uh, so they, the researchers did a little more digging. They did some soil analysis to see if they could figure out uh, where the nitrogen was. Uh, and they found that there was as much as 152 pounds of nitrogen where they had planted cover crop compared to where no cover crop was planted. But that 150 pounds of nitrogen was stored as non-available ammonium. Uh, and usually what happens is some of those types of soils, they have clay minerals that will bind nit um, ammonium and potassium particularly very strongly to that soil and it doesn't release with a, a short period of time. Now the question is, when would that be released? We don't really know because we're just starting to learn about all of those interactions that happens between different cover crop species, and also between soil types. And again, this is a study from North Dakota, they used the radish as the cover crop that they were testing. Now, Wisconsin did a similar study where they were also interested to see what's happening with the, the radish and how is it affecting um, crop yield and particularly um, corn grain yield. They did a study in many sites, and here presenting uh, a study from the, the site where it was in uh, Rock County in two years, two different years. And then in the first year, they primarily took a whole sample, uh, a whole biomass sample from that uh, cover crop to look at what was happening. And then they realized that they needed to partition that farther and see how was the distribution of nutrients within the above ground the below ground, and then they add it all up to see what was happening in the total biomass. So what they found is when they're looking at biomass yield, there's huge variability from year to year, right? And then as Axon was talking about, the growing degree days is very important. So if you plant the cover crop in the first couple of weeks in August, that's gonna have a huge impact on the biomass that is produced. And we can see that here, there doesn't seem to be a lot of growing degree days difference between the two years. For those on the phone, the first year was 2011, and we had 884 growing degree days. And then in the second year was 2012, and that was 622 days. Only about 260 growing degree days, but when we look at the biomass yield, for the first year, there was over um, six tons uh, in kilograms per hectare. Uh, and compared to the second year, there was about two tons. So there was three, time more, three times more biomass when you had uh, up to 250 growing degree more in, in one year compared to the next. Looking at the nitrogen uptake in that biomass that grew, again, in the first year when there was a lot more growing degree days, there was as much as uh, 200 uh, kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. That's, that's similar to 200 pounds per hectare. And when uh, we had lower degree days, it was less than half. Uh, it was between 40 to 80 pounds of uh, nitrogen be taken up by acre by that cover crop. 
And then looking at the CDN ratio, again, it was low. Um, it was way below what we would expect to see any immobilization. So all of this nitrogen should be released. And then when we're looking at, at the yields, um, so here I have a few more different sites so you can see the effect of location and cover crop interaction. So for the Rock County, uh, we have now three years of this study, 2012, 2013, and 2014. And you can see no differences between where the cover crop was planted and where the radish was planted as the cover crop. There was though some very big differences between the years, but not really between the cover crop for this location. However, when you look at another site at the Sheboygan County, we see some pretty big differences, pretty big drag in yield where cover crop was planted compared to where no cover crop was added. <clears throat> for example, for those not seeing the table, uh, in 2012, at this site where no cover crop was planted, there was 198 bushels of corn per acre. And where the radish was planted, there was 185. So there was a 13 bushels an acre drag for this particular site. And then in 2013, there was actually a 16 bushels an acre year um, drag in yield for this site. And then the third site was Washington County. <clears throat> And again, out of the three years, one year so we saw a difference in 10 bushels an acre where you planted radish, you saw this drag in yield. Um, so one of the things that is becoming clear here is that uh, having this radish now in two states, we're seeing that there is a potential drag in yield uh, when you have the cover crop compared to where no cover crop was planted. And again, those are only reddish cover crop. It wasn't mixed with other cover crops. So it seems to be something related to reddish and a particular soil type and how the clay mineralogy can play with that ammonium that the cover crop is uh, producing into that biomass. Now let's take a quick look at what's happening with some of our trials that we are doing here at our location at the Research and Outreach Center in Lamberton. Uh, we had uh, a couple different ways that we planted the cover crop. We had what we call single species mix, where we either had red clover or radish. And then we had a multi-species mix, where we had an annual mix. We had the tillage, bersim clover, and oats. And this would, be, uh, would not overwinter. They would die with the, the frost that came. And then we had a perennial mix, where we had the tillage radish, bersim clover, and winter rye, and the winter rye being our uh, crop that would actually make it over the winter and come back in the spring and do some more growth. <clears throat> and we applied some manure because we wanted to see what was happening with the nutrient availability. Uh, and we also had plots where no manure were applied so we could see whether that cover crop was limiting nutrients to the, to the plant or not. And we also incorporated tillage. Um, we had tillage done to incorporate the manure to follow universal recommendation, University of Minnesota recommendations. And we had plots where no manure was incorporated. <clears throat> uh, now I'm showing some graphs where we're looking at some results. Um, we are looking at um, cover crop biomass growth here uh, and I have 13 treatments. Treatment one and two are for the red clover and I forgot to tell you but the red clover was usually interseeded with the wheat so we had the full growing season to go whereas all of the other cover crops were planted after the wheat harvest so they had a much shorter growing season and the target date was usually in the first or second week of August but in 2014, uh, we did not get in that early because of weather and soil conditions. But in 2015, 2016, we did. And you can see that the biomass yield between those years is quite significantly more compared to 2014. Um, a couple of other things that we can see is that the red clover always has more biomass and that's primarily because of the higher uh, length of the growing season. Uh, now we can see here that there are many treatments without much labeling, but what we can see is that treatment one and two is the red clover, treatment three, four, and five 
Uh, this is just the tilted radish. Treatment six, seven, and eight is our uh, annual mix. Uh, and then treatment 9, 10, and 11 is our perennial mix. And then treatment 12 and 13 is our manure control. Treatment 12, there was no manure. Treatment 13, there was manure. Some things that really strike us here, the difference between the treatment they had tillage. Treatment 5, 8, and 11, they all had tillage, also 13. They all had tillage to incorporate the manure. And the treatments three, four, six, seven, eight, and nine, eight, nine and ten had no manure applied and therefore no tillage operations. We can see here that mostly of the differences we see were due to tillage and not really the cover crop. So having the differences in cover crop didn't really change the biomass being produced between those uh, different mixes. And just so you can have a visual and see what's happening. Uh, pictures here with a label 4, 7, and 10 is where no tillage was done. And treatments 5, 8, and 10 is where tillage <clears throat> was actually done. Uh, and we can see the huge difference that having that tillage there actually caused in terms of biomass production. And here again, but this is mostly showing you the red clover uh, compared to where no cover crop was planted. Whether have that tillage or not, it did not matter for this particular treatment because we planted that red clover the same early in the spring and therefore had a lot of time to grow regardless of whether or not there was tillage in that plot. Looking at wheat yield in terms of having that um, cover crop interseeded or not, uh, that red clover being interseeded, we saw no differences, no dragging yield on wheat harvest based on whether or not the red clover was there. That was exactly the same yield. Now, when you look at the corn yield as a function of uh, the treatments that we applied, uh, we here have our corn green yields in 2014, 2015, and 2016. Uh, in two out of the three years, we saw some pretty good significant yield differences in corn grain yield and what we observed is that where we had that three uh, species mix with that perennial mix with the winter rye in there, we saw a dragging yield again. Uh, it sometimes was as much as 20 bushels an acre in terms of a yield drag uh, between those, uh, those different um, cover crop uh, species that we planted. Now, we did not see that effect of the radish that had been observed in uh, North Dakota and at the study in Wisconsin. So for our soils, it appears that that effect is still not uh, observable, but there are some differences between the, the cover crop species that you were using in your mix. Uh, and then just to show a little bit more about the work that EXO has done and to, to take a, a quick look at some of the responses that they have observed in some of their trials in terms of uh, nutrient removal. Um, here we're looking at um, <clears throat> the biomass and nitrogen content when we do a spring termination. And then in the table, we have 2017 and 2013 for the amount of nitrogen accumulated at the three locations in Grand Rapids, Lamberton, and Wasika. And for these two years, it was actually not a lot of nitrogen being taken up by the biomass. It was about uh, 2017 between 10 and 17 pounds of N, and then in 2018, just between two and three and a half, 3.1 pounds of N. And look at the biomass yield, very low biomass yield. Uh, and now when we look at, uh, when we let the biomass grow a little more, if there's more time for it to grow and we do, uh, <clears throat> we, we measure the nitrogen in the fall, uh, we can see that depending on how much biomass is growing, there's quite a bit of nitrogen that can be removed. For example, in Grand Rapids, uh, some of the treatments could remove as much as 50 pounds um, of N per acre. Uh, and in Lamberton, even more, up to 75 
pounds of nitrogen per acre. And then in Mosica was a little less. The highest was 25 pounds of nitrogen per acre was removed with the, the cover crops. Um, and again, if there is enough biomass growth, is, that's when we observed all this nice nitrogen, nitrogen removal. But then in 2018, when biomass growth was very low in Lambton and Osik and Green Rapids, we see very little uh, removal of nitrogen in their biomass. And then if you look at the effect of uh, cover crop on soil uh, nitrate levels, I have a table here with data from uh, the fall of 2015, where I see that there was no effect whether you had the cover crop there or the control here. It's the NSC is the control. There's really no differences in the amount of nitrate in the soil. We come back in the spring in 2016, when the soil is a little warmer, there's some mineralization taking place. We see that the amount of nitrate increased compared to the, uh, the fall, but it's still no differences. But then as we have the system going on for the third consecutive year, we start to see that in the spring, when we have a no cover crop, we're starting to see that the control has a lot more nitrate in the soil than where we had a cover crop growing. So it appears that the effect of cover crop on nutrients in the soil, particularly nitrate, is not something you observe in a year or two. You need to have that system in place for a few years uh, in our case here, in Axel's case, more than three years were needed before he could start seeing the benefits of having that cover crop grow in terms of nutrient removal. Uh, and then, so if the cover crop is removing that nutrient, how fast is it gonna be before the nutrient is released back to the crop? First, we need to assume that the nutrient will be released. And according to some of the data that I showed you, in some cases, depending on the species we're planted, that's not gonna be released. Um, but if it is released, for example, here, the cover crops that Axel has tested, this is another slide uh, that Axel has shared with us for this uh, webinar. We see that the control is here, this uh, circle, this is the control. And then the other ones, the other symbols are all cover crops. And for those that are not able to see, uh, where we have a control, we had a, what we did here, we got biomass and we mixed it with the soil and then we tested to see how quick that um, nitrogen would mineralize. And we found that it would take between 20 to 30 days to see a pretty good start of mineralization, then the mineralization would start to slow down after 30 days, and then by about 50 to 60 days, pretty much everything had mineralized. Uh, and that's when we had planted corn, or if there was soybean was a little bit different, like the soybean plants, for some reason, it slowed down a little bit the mineralization. Uh, it was about 35 days before we peaked, but then after that peak, it also starts to go down. And by 60 days, all that would mineralize had pretty much mineralized. So in summary, what we are seeing is that mineralization will happen as long as the biomass uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio is within below 30 to one, meaning that there is potential for mineralization. And we see that that can mineralize um, assuming that it will mineralize if that if we don't have the radish in there. It seems like the radish is, is doing a little, board, a little bit more uh, interactions with soil and, and nitrogen and it's difficult to tell when things will release and when things are not going to release. Um, so just a couple take home points. Uh, cover crop is getting a lot more attention from researchers in the upper Midwest um, farmers are slowly uh, increasing the adoption. Some farmers that have been doing for a long term are seeing a lot more um, results. Uh, and it seems that the longer you keep that in the system, the, the more effective they become. It can be very frustrating at the beginning, the first couple of years, because there's so much uncertainty. But as you learn the system and as you keep going, uh, it seems to get easier. Uh, we have still a lot of questions regarding management practices. What 
it's the proper mix to use, what's going to maximize the nutrient availability, uh, how is the nutrient going to be released. Uh, as Axel, Axel mentioned, uh, down south, in the south of the United States, they have done cover crop much longer, they have a much better understanding, but a lot of the assumptions that work for them there is not proven right for us here. So I think we still have a lot of work to do uh, to develop the best management practices that we uh, need to have for our state and to maximize the use of cover crops. And I think with that, I'll turn back to Liz uh, and see if we have uh, questions that we need to. Okay, address. all right, thanks, Paulo. And uh, yes, I see you on our clock. We are past our one o'clock time, so I understand if anybody needs to cut out, but we will have this uh, recorded. But anybody who does, does want to stay online, yet we do have some questions here in the box, and we can try to answer those uh, again if anybody has any questions, but uh, please do again, just some other housekeeping things, the valuation link, uh, those of you that do need to sign up, please do check that. We do appreciate your input on that. Uh, and remember our next webinar is coming up on the 13th of February and the 27th as well. Um, so with that, I will ask one of the first questions here. Uh, and the question is, uh, and Paul, this probably goes to you, what is the best way to measure how much nitrogen is available from the cover crop? Yeah, that's a good question, Paul. Um, I would tell you right now the best way to know, um, we don't have a proper test to know how much will be available, right? But the best we can do is collect a sample, a biomass sample from the above ground of the, bio, the, the cover crop you are doing and send it in for analysis. That will give you the total amount of nitrogen in that biomass, right? Now, we also need to have an estimation of what biomass yield is being produced per acre. Uh, so I recommend you get in touch with us to learn how to um, estimate the biomass yield because that could be another 20-minute uh, webinar on how you estimate the biomass yield out of your plots. But get in touch with us. We'll teach you how to estimate biomass yield in an acre. But the best you can do is take a sample of your biomass, send it to a lab for uh, nutrient total nutrient content, and that will be a you know, proportion of how much uh, your cover crop will contribute to your uh, nutrient availability for that biomass. Axel, do you want to add anything to it? Oh, I guess it's basically what you said. It's a combination of the total nitrogen and the plant sample that we have sent to the lab, to the lab and then to have a pretty good estimate of the total biomass that we are getting into one acre, for example. So no, that's basically what we should do. But the second part, yes, it would take a little bit more longer to, to explain in this webinar. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. Uh, and then this one is also directed to you, Paulo. Uh, based on your research, would you recommend adjusting nitrogen application only after you have three to five years of cover crop history? Hi, Shane. Uh, thank for the question. That's a very good question as well. And, and you're right on. Yes, for the first uh, two to three, four years, I would not... I would be very concerned about changing nitrogen recommendations based on what we are observing with the work we are doing. Um, and I would say, you know, keep, keep track, keep seeing what yields doing um, and keep testing. It would, be, it would be ideal to test, maybe not every year, but maybe every other year test and see how much nitrogen your cover crop is, is taking up. That will help you get an estimation of how much nitrogen you might get mineralized next year. But I would say after the fourth year, starting the fifth year, you can start playing with the nitrogen rates. Um, depending on the mix you're using, you saw there there's potential for over 100, 150, 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. So keep a close eye and start playing with that, but be very careful because you might be short on nitrogen needs if you go too early in the system. Okay, thank you. And here's another one. I think both of you could take a stab at this one. It says, what management can be used to help deal with changing weather conditions? I don't know. Please, I to... lost you. Can you repeat the question, oh, please? Sure. Uh, what management can be used to help deal with changing weather conditions? So, uh, well, it depends on which, uh, which management are we talking about. If it is, for example, for, uh, for seeding cover crops and under weather conditions, the probably the best way to do it is air seeding, uh, which I have seen it, uh, even though the establishment of cover crops is not as good as 
if we drill it. But uh, under those conditions, uh, I would be considering, uh, you know, an air seeding uh, system. As for termination, there is not much we can say because, or we can do because we have to wait for the good conditions to get into the field and uh, terminate that cover crop. Um, other than that, I probably leave it to Paulo if Paulo has something else to, to add to this question. Yeah, no, um, we are actually, uh, we just wrote a proposal to, to have some of their work done. Um, because there's a lot of talk right now, especially among organic farmers, about using um, some of those deep-rooted cover crops like the radish. I showed some pictures. I didn't talk much about it. But some of those radishes can grow to one and a half to two feet down, and they have very thick, very big roots that they can create very big channels that can help with water infiltration. Um, there are other very aggressive cover crops they have very aggressive rooting systems that can also help uh, with water infiltration. But again, for us here, there's not enough work done yet to provide good recommendations. And we really gotta do more research and see if we can um, develop some management practices that we can use to help remediate some of that soil moisture issues that we're seeing now with a lot of more rainfall in the late fall and also early spring. Okay, and here's uh, another one that says, have you seen an increase in nutrient availability, no P or K added after mixed winter cover crop? Um, so I think there was a question, it's kept there by Shane. Uh, oh no, that, oh, that one was answered, that's right. This is a different Sorry. one, yep. Um, yeah, so there is another, that's an, one, another one of those that they're talking about cover crop roots going down and then bringing up nutrients from the lower horizon up to the surface and they're becoming available. Um, but based on the research we have done, I have not seen much of that, Rochelle. Um, there are some, some work has shown some of that, but like I showed you a little bit on nitrates, we actually see less nitrates where you have the cover crop and then we would see an increase if that cover crop actually mineralizes. Uh, but I would say that the work on cover crop nutrient availability is just starting in Minnesota. There's very little information. Um, and yeah, we, we don't really have any conclusive story to tell you right now okay so yeah there's a follow-up one about with tillage too so don't really have information on that yet either uh, with tillage like if it's uh you know strip till conventional or no till yeah no not in terms of the nutrient availability okay. uh, some of the things we saw is that when we do the tillage um I think what happened in our case, it, that provided a better growing environment for the corn that came up after. Uh, because when you look at the control where there was uh, no cover crop or cover crop without the tillage, we didn't really see any difference. But where we saw the tillage, that helped. So if you are in a case where uh, you plant a cover crop, cover crop and you're gonna go under a no-till uh, situation, you might see a drag. You might see a drag in yield because having that tillage, uh, somehow we don't know exactly the mechanism that happened, but having the tillage did help um, with grain yield. I don't know if it was more nutrient mineralizable or just water. Maybe it was a little bit of water, maybe a combination. Uh, but yeah, what we saw is that no till seems to do it some drag in the yield. So if I can add to that as well, uh, Liz. So we've done no-till, street till, and conventional till with cover crops. And what we have seen it is that basically the tillage practice uh, masks the effect of uh, the cover crop. And the reason for that is because our co cover crop biomass has been very little. So there is not much effect of the cover crops itself, but the effect of the tillage practice. Okay. Okay. And I think I'm, I'll squeak one more in here. How can I get my C to N ratio? Do you have any information on that? Is there a standard soil test or special test? Um, it doesn't say, yeah, if this is, yeah, just how can I get my C to N ratio? 
That, that's an easy one. Uh, you yes. take a <laughs> biomass sample, send it to the lab, and uh, you request the CDN, CDN ratio. They will do a total carbon, a total nitrogen, and then they send both of them to you, and they also do the CDN ratio. Okay. Now, if not, if you have just carbon and nitrogen, just divide one. Oh, and this uh, is the of other, the soil was to clarify that. Okay. Oh, sorry. of the soil. So the any oh. ratio of the that soil. That wasn't clear to me either. What, what do you want it there? It's the same. Yeah, you have to yes. request because it's not a standard test that the lab the labs will do. So you have to request uh, a CDN. You can, uh, like Axel said, you can request a total carbon, a total nitrogen, and then you divide one by the other. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I do have one last one here if you want to hang on. It says, if cover crop's not harvested but plowed under in the spring before planting corn, assuming a normal growing, uh, you know, conditions the next year is, a, in general, is the mineralization rate in sync with corn's rapid end uptake growth stage? Well, uh, let me see if I understood. It's basically asking whether or not, you know, having the cover crop, uh, residue uh, you know in the field is going to decompose uh in time enough for the next corn crop to use it is that one yes yeah okay uh, basically basically what we have seen it is that uh, as paulo was showing some of our results we will ha you will have maximum mineralization in about 35 to 45 days uh which is more or less a time when uh your corn is starting to use nitrogen actually probably very close to when you side rest nitrogen so, but uh, we, we have to be very careful because having that portion of the total nitrogen from the res crop residue available as uh, nitrate doesn't mean that uh, it's going to be all used by the crop, depending on weather conditions. But if uh, the person is asking, um, is saying that under optimum weather conditions, I would say that yes, we will have a, a pretty uh, good amount of nitrogen that is going to be used by the corn crop in that case. Okay, well, that is it what we have for questions today. Thanks, everybody, for attending, and thank you, Axel and Paulo, for presenting today. And again, a reminder, please do uh, fill out that evaluation link. We much appreciate your input on that. Again, this is kind of a newer way of getting information out for us, so we do appreciate your feedback on that. And keep in mind, we do have uh, our other webinars coming up on February 13th. Um, and that'll be a pest topic. And then on the 27th, that'll be focused on weed management. So uh, thank you very much for your attention today and uh, hope to see you again. All right, thank you everybody.